Hi, my name is Eric Rosen. Thanks for being with us today. This is a joint effort of 3i and the Rosen Report. And in today's podcast, I interview Greg Waldorf, who is not only a dear friend of mine, he's an amazing investor, CEO, and an all, overall interesting person. He teaches the number one class at Stanford Business School called Entrepreneurship Garage. And I learned a lot from our short discussion. I hope you enjoy. Thanks for joining. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Rosen from the Rosen Report. And part of 3i's continuing founder series, I have the pleasure of speaking with Greg Waldorf today. We're going to learn a lot of interesting things about Greg and how he's invested his time and money over the past years. So, Greg, tell us where you grew up. I grew up in Los Angeles on the west side and uh, have lived in the Bay Area most of my adult life. Wow. How, uh, how's living in the Bay Area lately? It's a little chaotic, no? We're uh, pretty far from San Francisco, so it, it stays uh, pretty quiet in the Palo Alto area. Oh, yeah. Palo Alto is nice. I like it. Stanford. Here we go. Okay, so I believe you started a software company at 13. Can you tell us about that one? Sure. Um, when I turned 13, uh, I had a bar mitzvah, and I took $500 of gifts that I had received, and I decided to buy a computer. And I bought an Atari 400 computer from a store called Video 2001 in Westwood, which sound very futuristic in 1981. <laughs> and uh, I taught myself how to program. And wow. beginning with teaching myself how to program, I, at that point, knew more than a lot of our friends and neighbors. And so I started my first business, which was helping people to set up their own computers in, uh, in their homes. And from there, it led to helping a lot of entrepreneurs around Los Angeles who had businesses that wanted to figure out how to use technology and computers to forward their own businesses. And so it was a really unusual experience as a teenager, but it also was created by this uh, unique era where entrepreneurs and small businesses didn't have anyone to support them. So they were willing to turn to a teenage <laughs> kid to uh, write software for them and help them to use those products. What, what language were you using back then? Was it Python and Java? What was it then? Do you even know? Oh, gosh. Uh, I first learned to uh, program with uh, BASIC. And so okay, like a lot basic. of people wow. in the early 80s. Yeah. And, uh, and then there were what were called third-generation relational databases. And those databases allowed us to build software for all different kinds of companies, everything from entertainment industry to retail, wholesale manufacturing. And it really was my first business school because when you write software for someone to help them power their own business, uh, you have to learn a lot about how their business operates. Amazing. I love that story. Entrepreneurial at a young age. So Greg, you've done a lot of things in your career. Can you give us some of the highlights? I think the easiest way to think about uh, or talk about my career is to say that I have been an entrepreneur. I've started businesses. I've been a hired CEO where I've run businesses that I did not start, but I grew them uh, through a significant part of their uh, history. And I've also been both an angel investor, an institutional investor. I've invested in the public markets, private markets. And uh, I think what makes all that unique is that I've sat on a lot of sides of the table uh, over you know 30 plus years. And uh, now that I teach, I think I can bring a lot into my conversations because I've sat in so many different seats. Amazing. So you were a, a founding investor for eHarmony and then eventually became right. the CEO. So can we talk about, I mean, that was really at the cutting edge of when it was not so cool to be an online dater. So talk about right. how, how it came about, your investment, and how you became CEO. I was introduced in the late 90s to the founders of uh, eHarmony. And at the time, it was a, a pre-launch business. And as you alluded to, it's hard to really convey how sketchy <laughs> <laughs> online dating was considered in that era of around 1999. Certainly was not something where anybody was going to look for a serious relationship. <laughs> and the founders of eHarmony had a really unique idea, which was, could they bring technology and internet distribution to the serious end of the relationship market, which turned out to be huge. And I invested in an idea to build a matching system. And that matching system later became eHarmony. And um, through kind of a, a long 
uh, sequence of events about five years after that investment or six years, uh, I served as interim CEO after we had a CEO transition that didn't go well and ultimately CEO. The most notable thing in the market over that decade, roughly, was just how much it changed. You know, it went from nobody would have ever imagined that you could even have a serious relationship that you met someone online to by the end, people were sending in, you know, hundreds of submissions a week to be in television ads because they wanted to be, you know, featured as a really successful couple. How many people were getting married a day or a year with this, with the three harmony? It was a huge number, right? Yeah, by uh, 2009 or 10, when we, we would do research every year, it was about 5% of marriages in the United States, which I recall equated at that time to 542 people a day getting married wow. uh, Look at from you. eHarmony. And so certainly a lot of marriages. So, okay. So now that you are the relationship expert among all your other areas of expertise, what is the key to the successful relationship? What what are the most critical things that match people on eHarmony that led to successful relationships? We did a lot of research on this. And, and granted, I'm pretty dated on the research, but I suspect it hasn't changed too much. What we found across every country, every culture that we did research, we were a global business, was that what was important in a long-term relationship match was having a lot in common around the more deep values of, of a relationship. And so nobody wanted to marry their clone or their twin, and that's certainly not what the matching model did. But what it turned out to be is that if you you know are dating and you both like skiing or you both like the same music, that can be a lot of fun, but it doesn't actually equate to a long-term happy marriage. And what did equate and tend to lead to a long-term happy marriage was having the same views and values, not just about religion, but essentially the important things in how you live your life. And in my own casual observation of you know friends and family and my own relationship, I think that turned out to be true. Great. Great. So you, you alluded to it. You, you've been a venture investor, entrepreneur, CEO, teacher. You've done every angle of a startup. What's your favorite role to play? What, what's, what's, what do you enjoy spending your time doing the most? You know, for me, I think that working as part of a team or working through other people is, has been super gratifying for me. And there are certain types of entrepreneurs who I believe are really the center of the story in a very well-deserved way. Um, we can think of super iconic founders uh, like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk, who are you know almost inseparable from the company. And while I'm proud of what I've done as an entrepreneur, I'm probably most proud of what I've been able to do with the people that I've been building companies with. And it is, I think, not a typical trait of somebody who can be an effective CEO to also be able to kind of sit in the second row, which is the role of being an investor or board member or advisor or teacher to help other people to be successful as well, not just subordinates and the people who work for you, but to have a genuine sense of your own uh, success coming through someone else doing well. And it was later in my life that I figured out that People would describe me as ambitious, and I think that is true, but I'm not particularly competitive. And and I think it's unique to be personally quite ambitious, but not to feel when I look at other people's success that maybe somehow I'm not gaining or I'm not winning because they are. And I love to see my friends succeed. I love to see the people that I support to succeed, whether I have a financial benefit or not, I've always taken a lot of gratification. And selfishly, I think I've learned a lot from other people's mistakes. To be privileged to sit through opportunities uh, that are sometimes executed well and sometimes not, hmm. I've been able to you know, kind of build my own list of things to do and not do. And that's a, a great uh, boost in one's life. Listen, I agree a hundred percent. I think taking pride in other people's successes is not something that happens as much as it should. And, um, you know, I think, uh, the fact that you do that is fantastic. So now you're doing that by teaching an entrepreneurship class at Stanford. Can you tell us about that, how that's evolved? And when you think about an MBA over the last 30 years, what that's happened and maybe 
what do the kids struggle the most with uh, when you're teaching them or what's your most asked question? Yeah, I graduated in 1984. And so I, I think often about, you know, how long that's been. I mean, it's been almost 30 years. Uh, when I was a student, it would have been like meeting uh, a graduate from the early 1960s. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's just hard to imagine how old You're I really old. thought that person was, right? <laughs> I, I definitely am. Well, we're the same age. So that's scary. Yeah. When I went to business school in the early 90s, um, I think I was still part of the era where Though I had been an entrepreneur, which was super unusual, if I recall out of my class of 330 roughly students, there were only six or seven entrepreneurs. Um, most people who went to business school in that era did it because it was an important credential in their own career progression at the firm that they were at. So whether you worked for an investment bank like Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, whether you're a consultant at you know, McKinsey or Bain, all of these places basically said, be an analyst, you know, or a BA, and you do your work for two years, and then you go often paid by your employer to business school. That's what I did. And you'll get this important education and credential, and then you'll come back as an associate and on you go up the ladder. And at some point, my guess in the 2000s, these firms realized that they were literally paying for their best people to go to business school and often not come back because yeah. it was a great opportunity to see the rest of the world. And somehow in the last 20 years, an MBA has become very unlikely to be a required credential in your own career progression. So the question becomes, who ends up going to business school? And my observation is... It is now the you know cohort of people who are switchers. So they want to do something fairly radically different in their career. Um, I think they may go from a, a global job. Let's say they're working in the nonprofit industry, and we see a lot of people who work, you know, in some sort of uh, I would say kind of nonprofit or government global type job and now they want to move toward tech if they're coming to Stanford or they want to move to a more corporate type world. And so they look at coming to business school very accurately as a way to help them make this massive career shift, not just a small adjustment like going from banking to private equity. They're really trying to access a whole new world of people. And, and I think that's really who comes today uh, to business school. To answer the second part of your question on, you know, what do students struggle with, I can really only answer that through the lens of the class that, I, you know, I'm part of the teaching team, which is Startup Garage, which is a kind of the flagship entrepreneurship class from the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies within the business school. And I think the hard thing for MBA students in particular is that they often fall in love with their own idea. <laughs> and the class that we teach really tries to drum out of them this idea that they will be the rare entrepreneur who can just think up an idea. And instead, what we teach is very different than what MBA students learned 30 years ago when I was a student. Because 30 years ago, you always heard if you had an entrepreneurial idea, go write a business plan go write a business plan. You would sure. you know, kind of hold yourself up in the library. You would write this 30-page document. And uh, Stefano Senios, who's the faculty member who created our class, realized after he went to interview entrepreneurs and saying, let me see your business plan, that that's not really how it happened. And so instead, what he found out was, and this maps my own experience, is that great entrepreneurs really do a ton of need finding in the area that they're in. And that intensive need-finding exercise helps them ultimately come up with a solution, a product, and a company that can be quite successful. So it's a long answer, but the struggle for MBAs oftentimes is, I believe I have this need. I've thought of a solution. Let's go. And you can waste millions of dollars and years of your life when you could have shortcutted the process to realize that the solution was something different or was even a valuable offering. Uh, for the world. And, and and that is the thing that we try to help people with. Well, you said a lot of things that, that I agree with. We're friends because I have a lot of respect for you and you're a great person, but it sounds like we think a lot alike. I, I went to business school. I went to University of Chicago. I think it was 144 years ago. And um, yes, things have changed a lot. But back then, you only went, for most part, either they were paying for you, which they did for me, or you were, an, you were a consultant that wanted to go and invest in banking. You were an investment banking that wanted to go. You right. wanted to go to another thing. So I agree with that 100%.
And what you just said about entrepreneurs and business plans, I, I, I've been speaking to a lot of people about this. And all the success stories that I hear is, I was struggling because I wanted this to happen and I couldn't have it and no one had it. So I felt if it was a problem for me, it was a problem for everybody. And it, there's some truth to that. So if you're solving a problem, I think that goes a long way. And everybody has a great idea. But if you're really solving a problem, I think I think that's critical. So really, really good thoughts. So uh, what was your most recent CEO role? So I was most recently CEO of a company called invoice to go which was um, an example of a, another company where I was not the founder, but I was hired as the CEO. So um, invoice to go was founded in a small town on the central coast of Australia, if you can believe it, wow. um, about two hours north of Sydney. And it was a business focused on the smallest of small businesses that typically did home services. So plumber, electrician, carpenter, people like that. And the insight there was that those kinds of people, if you picture one person driving in a van, really didn't want full featured accounting software. They had one principal need, and that was to send an invoice and get paid. And the founder of the business, Chris Strode, did a great job of building initially a website and then a mobile app that really rode the wave of early mobile adoption from the iPhone that allowed people to send that invoice right from the truck. And uh, I joined in 2014 as part of a, the first investment. It was entirely bootstrapped uh, from Axel Partners, where I was a CEO in residence. And I joined as CEO, and I was a significant co-investor in the Series A. And we uh, bought the business, or a majority of it. And Chris stayed in the business, but he was very clear that he did not want to be CEO. And so I took over at that point what was then a much smaller business and really took it and moved it into being uh, something that resembled more a recurring revenue SaaS business and began the approach of trying to have a payments business as well so that we would get paid or earn revenue every single time someone paid through the system. And I ran that business for six plus years um, through the pandemic in 2020 uh, hired another CEO uh, toward the end, thinking that it would be quite a bit longer before we sold the business. But within a year, this terrific person that uh, followed me had already uh, had a term sheet to sell the business to Bill.com, which made a lot of sense for them and for us because they were really, they are an incredible payables business and we were a receivables business that had a global footprint. And so by the time the business got sold in 21, we had about 250,000 small businesses around the world sending $2 billion a month of invoices through our platform. What a, and great timing. Uh, you sold in 2021 before uh, the melee and, and, and revaluation, which was, which was decently lower. So uh, give me some uh, advice that we can share with some of the younger followers about if they're earlier in their career, what would, what would be good career advice? You've given some. But you know, what, what would be your best career advice for somebody younger in their careers? I think well-time-tested advice that I, I give to younger people is to really go deep and specialize when they are young in their career. I think that when you're coming out of college or graduate school, there's a lot of attraction to generalist jobs, things where you can be special assistant to the CEO, director of special projects, because they are really fun. And you get a lot of visibility into the boardroom, the CEO's life. But my fear for those kind of staff type jobs is you don't become excellent at anything. And if you can push yourself when you're young to really be good at something, and if you don't like that thing that you're doing, you can always change. It is a much better foundation in my experience for later in your career to have that broader perspective and the types of jobs that you know, do allow you to be in the boardroom. So whether it's to go deep in finance or product management or marketing or sales, and I think sales is deeply underrated as a terrific career for younger people because there's not a business in this world that doesn't need to sell to customers. And that, that's a valuable lesson I learned from my dad. It is something that is worth doing is going deep. And if you can go deep, then people will look to you as an expert and somebody that they want to pull into a startup or an entrepreneurial company because they would know, oh, I can call Eric because Eric is great at this thing. No, that's interesting. You know, I've always 
I've taken a little bit of a different view and I, hearing what you just articulated, I, I think that sounds nice. When I was coming up from the Wall Street perspective in Wall Street, I wanted to have, be an analyst of, across as many sectors as I could so I could be smart enough and say, oh, I really like technology. I want to learn more about technology than my next job going to technology. Because coming out of school, I really didn't know what I, how, to, how I wanted to focus. So I tried to be a little bit more broad and then I found that trading was my passion and then I got into trading and then that's really trading and investing is what I did since. But, you know, it's interesting, uh, that perspective, which is good. So everybody has had, I, I would just say about that, Eric, I, I would say, I think what you're saying qualifies in the sense that it's okay to be able to analyze companies and, and say, I do it across a lot of yeah. sectors, Yeah, but it wasn't like you were doing that, um, it, it, at such a high one inch deep kind of level that's right. that's that you yep. didn't have expertise that then supported you. And the other thing I'll say is I think one of the hard things for younger people is the generalist advice of follow your passion, because the reality is a lot of younger people don't know what their passion is. Mm. And, and you may not figure that out till later in your life. So particularly when I hear people say that to, you know, teenagers, I always think it's, it, it's it's fortunate if someone does know, but it's kind of empty advice because a typical person just says, I don't know yet. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect them to know yet. Good point. So I think we've all had successes and failures. You seem to have had quite a few successes with great timing and great investments. Uh, you know, what have you learned from some of your failures and, uh, you know, w what are you investing in today? You know, and can I invest along with you because you seem to make a lot of money in investing? Well, look, I think as an investor, for me, um, you kind of learn a lot, at least in my case, from the mistakes that I've made. And I think that there's no other way to get around that you have to make some mistakes in order to get to successes. And for me, that you know, the principles of that probably become, especially as I've gotten older is you know only investing with individuals if it's a private company or a fund that I really believe in. Um, I can point to many examples where I had an initial feeling that maybe wasn't completely aligned and, and that maybe just comes down to trusting your gut. Another thing is the spots and levels that I'm interested in investing in. Um, I've found more success actually not investing with a super hot company um, and instead investing with an entrepreneur that I believe in where the super hot companies, I think from a risk reward standpoint, oftentimes don't turn out well because there's so much expectation built into whether it's the valuation or the way that the CEO operates or the number of people who get hired. Timing the market is really hard. And this expression, which is, I believe, attributed to Warren Buffett, which is time in the market is more important than timing the market has absolutely been true in my career, which is back to this idea that if you're invested in businesses, whether I'm operating it or someone else's or funds, I'd rather be right over the long period of time that will generate return than trying to time the return because of a trend that maybe doesn't have good unit economics, something that I don't believe in. So as a good example of that would be, you know, I can remember when Uber launched um, in the early 2010s, and I was using it quite a bit. The Bay Area was their first market. I don't think I would have invested in it at the time. I know I wouldn't have if I'd had the opportunity because I didn't really understand how that could be a good business over the long term. And in the short term, I definitely was wrong. I mean, it was an incredible investment for anybody who is an early stage investor. But over the very long period of time, it turns out maybe that's not such a great business, whether it's Uber or Lyft. And you've got to invest in the kind of businesses that you fundamentally feel comfortable with because every one of these investments is a grind. It's a total yeah. grind. And when you think about how many, how many years uh, Uber was in business for, what, 12 or 13 years before they had any profits. I mean, they were initially subsidizing the rides. I remember living in New York City in the, in during that time. Yeah. And a ride to LaGuardia Airport was like $14 and the cab was 35. I'm like, this is too good to be true. I'm in a nice car and I'm going, now I went right. from LaGuardia Airport, it was $77 for the same ride. I mean, so right. now they're making money, but it took a long time to get there and a lot of losses. I mean, I don't know how many billions of dollars of losses they had over the 12 or 13 years, but it was a big number. And, and I'll just, you know, wrap up this point of, you know, if you say, well, what kind of businesses do I like? 
in the end, I'm a kind of a unit economic snob where, you know, gross margin contribution margin to me are the tell for any business. You know, if I have to make a decision, I really want to see impressive unit economics. It's actually the, something that I'm most passionate about teaching at Stanford in the class that I teach in the winter quarter. Um, I look at that. And then, of course, if you do believe in those high gross margin businesses, you know, what's the cash flow cycle? What's the dynamic? And if I stick with what I'm comfortable with, that in general will lead me to good companies on the private side. And that, you know, I'm only talking about tech right now. Great. So, I mean, it's a great segue into the market today. We've seen the tech market for a long time. It was FANG only, and, you know, there is no alternative and you got to invest. And then we had a bit of a correction last year, and now things are coming back fairly strongly. What do you see as the opportunity set, uh, given places like SVB are gone and some of the lenders and some of the investors have pulled back? Are you seeing a lot more interesting opportunities today than a year ago? Or what do you, what do you think about the market opportunities today in venture? You know, in venture, and, and I would say I'm a somewhat active investor, but I don't spend, you know, I'm not listening to 20 mm. pitches a week. So it's important to caveat mm. what I say. I, I still think the impact of moving from a zero interest rate world to a, you know, 5%, you know, one year world is is so powerful and so huge that the market is really still adjusting. I, I, I think that, of course, there are great companies being founded this month and there will be next month. But in aggregate, there is a readjustment that I believe still is going on within the whole tech market about cost of capital, what that implies about how much you can spend on a company and building a company, what the likely outcomes are. And it it's not surprising to me that it's going to take more than two years for that all to flow through. Um, you know, just as an example, when we sold Invoice to Go in 2021, um, the business was sold for about $650 million. And there was literally not one news story written about that acquisition. I mean, of course, there was a press mm. release on the Bill.com site and they filed an 8K. But it showed you how uh, insignificant an investment, uh, an outcome was like that. And the world might go back to many sub billion dollar outcomes. And that is a lot of money that what there was a lot of money invested over the last kind of eight years with this expectation of outcomes that may have been at such a high multiple to revenue that still the entrepreneurs today are going to have to let that flow through to the way that they build these companies. Yeah, good thoughts. I mean, the euphoria was a little crazy. Some of the prices, uh, you know, that, that they're trading at as a, as a multiple of sales, you know, it's uh, you need a hell of a lot of growth. I just, in a recent note I wrote, I compared ARM to NVIDIA and others, and you know, NVIDIA is projected to grow at 170% and ARM was like 11%, yet it was trading at a much higher PE, uh, PE ratio. So I think that's interesting. Um, so we, we're, we're at a 3i event here. Uh, talk to us about your involvement in 3i, what you're getting most out of it, and what you think is most interesting. And if, if you know, we have a big community at 3i of, of a bunch of successful people, is there anything they could do to help you and what, what you're trying to accomplish? Well, sure. I mean, I, I joined 3i probably, I'm guessing, about a year and a half ago, so call it early 2022. And when I met Teddy and the team, I was so glad that they were doing what they were doing because I had actually tried to start something similar, not as a business, but multiple times I had thought, boy, I do a lot of investing. We've talked about tech, but I do a lot of non-tech, everything from real estate to energy. I'm looking at critical minerals now. I mean, a wide range of categories. And I always thought I wish I could have an informal network of people who I respected and trusted, who we could exchange ideas, we could do due diligence together. And I never was able to get enough of a critical mass to make it happen. And when I saw what 3i was trying to do, I thought, I need this. This is exactly where I am in my life. And it's turned out even better than I thought. Um, you know, I don't mean to make it sound like a commercial or an ad, but I've met wonderful people uh, who, in areas beyond just straight investing, have uh, been really additive to my life uh, on a friendship basis and also on a professional basis. And so I love, um, you know, what the 
growth of 3i offers because the more good people who are in the network the more that i can get out of it and also the more that i can give you know i love that you know people like you are super active and hopefully i'm considered in that group too where i'm helping other members as well 100 percent. i mean that's how we met and we become friendly through 3i and for that i'm thankful you know i've I always had a what I think was a pretty good Rolodex, a pretty good network that I would put against most people. And now with the inclusion of 3i, it's only gotten that much better. So uh, I'm excited about it. So Greg, this was a really uh, fun uh, time and I learned a lot as I always do when I speak with you. So thank you for sharing your thoughts and wisdom with us and uh, we, we should do it again. So thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate it.